Amen. Uh, great. Well, folks, thank you so much for coming tonight. So good to see so many out. Um, let me encourage you to grab a Bible if you have one. Uh, also, this is going to be a great chance for us to take notes. Yeah, you guys can come and sit right at the front. Great chance to take notes. So if you have a, a pad, um, I maybe should have sent out an email earlier in the week just to encourage you to do that. If not, just on your phone, just get the notes section up on your phone. Because um, let me just tell you a bit about what we're going to do and why that's going to be a good thing to do to take notes. So this evening we're starting a series called What Do I Do When My Mate Says Dot Dot Dot? And we planned this series maybe about a year ago. Um, we've been using our evening services much more to equip us as disciples of Jesus, um, to complement what we do in the morning, just a chance in the evening, a bit more uh, stripped back to do different things. But with that big aim of being disciple, making disciples of Jesus. So what we're going to do this evening is just change the diet just a little bit for the next number of weeks. And we're going to be thinking about some of the, the uh, cultural creeds, I'll call them that, the cultural phrases that people in our culture use today. Uh, and how we might, with both the compassion and the conviction of Jesus, answer our friend's uh, claims. Now, we're going to do a number of these. So tonight we're thinking about love is love. We're also going to be thinking about my body, my choice. Uh, is Christianity bad for women? Can you take the Bible literally? Uh, are all religions the same? So we thought these are some of the things that our friends our neighbours, our family members, some of the things that people hold. And so how can we get under the skin of those claims, understand them, love people well, and witness for Jesus wherever he has put us? So that is the aim of what we're doing this evening. Here's how it's going to go. We're going to have about a 20-25-minute 20 uh, 20, minute talk about this whole idea of what the, uh, love is love. Uh, thinking about some of these things, we're then going to go into groups, just to chat for 10-15 minutes about some of the things um, that will come up from tonight. Then we'll have a little bit of feedback uh, from the groups and a chance for people to ask any questions that they have as well. And Graham and I will, will try and field those, think if we can uh, have some answers. If not, we'll go away and think about it and then come back. But it's a chance, just a safe place that we hope to discuss these things together. So, love is love. You ready for this? Come on, a bit of enthusiasm. Yeah? Yes. We're ready. Okay. All you can be in life is honest with yourself. I can't change who I am. Today I am proud of myself. So those were the words of former this morning presenter Philip Schofield when he came out as a gay man on national television back in 2020. And I watched that clip back this week. The whole thing, it's about 13, 15 minutes, I think, just to kind of relive that moment. Because I remember where I was when I watched him uh, give his, his national television speech. In the same interview as I watched it back, he went on to speak about his inner sense of, of conflict and how what was bothering him the most was living with the pain that he knew coming out was causing his family. Now, what played out in that moment, as I watched it, I remember thinking it was so revealing for where we are as a culture on this whole area. Now, let's put aside for one moment everything that followed in the years to come with the allegations that came out about Philip Schofield. Let's put that to the side for a minute and let's concentrate on that moment as he comes out on national television. Because I remember listening to him and thinking to myself, buddy, listen, you've still got a choice, right? Despite the feelings that he had towards other men or he has towards other men, he's still in that moment, if you think about it, could have chosen to stay a, a married man, to stay with his family. But what was interesting is that within seven minutes of him going public, his co-host Holly Willoughby started asking him about future relationships. Could he, has he thought about future relationships? He said no, and obviously we know that wasn't, wasn't true. Um, but why was that revealing 
It was revealing because she spoke on behalf of our culture who looked on at this man and said, he has no choice. He has to, like all of us, be true to himself because after all, love is love. And like a hermit crab, if you get tired of one shell and you feel drawn to go and make your home in another shell, well, you kind of got to do what you got to do. And what so often happens with showbiz cases like that, and we really could have picked a number of them this evening. If you think about Matt Hancock, a kind of similar thing played out there. Um, Adele, kind of similar thing played out there. That way of thinking at showbiz level, it so often trickles down to the street. And I guess that's where we connect with this, this whole idea tonight of love is love. Because how many of us will have friends, family members, neighbours who subscribe to the whole idea of love is love? And the truth is, they are people that we really love dearly. And they aren't seeking attention. They're not seeking fame. They're just trying to make sense of the feelings inside and they just want to get on with their life. So love is love for many of our friends and family is a genuine play at happiness. Now, what do you say to that as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus? I think we've got to start by saying it's really hard. It's really hard. There's emotion and there's pain and there's people in this. Let me just chuck a few ideas out at you. Now, I've got a friend, David. He's a, a pastor in Paris, in France. He once conducted a national survey of how many Christians up and down that land felt confident in articulating what the Bible has to say in some of the current issues of our day. 15% of people in France, according to his survey, said they were confident, which means 85% said they felt pretty un unconfident. And it's so true, isn't it? Too often we are like the proverbial rabbit in the headlights. That we don't know how to respond. And I think Vaughn Roberts gets it so right. If we haven't done our thinking on how we can respond both with compassion and conviction, we either go to two extremes. We go what he calls yuck, and we just run a mile. So we just come out and be separate. Or we go yes, and we just go into the world and be like everyone else. But what I want to call us to do tonight, what I think Jesus calls us to do, is to be distinct, is to be different, and to follow him in going towards people and loving them with both compassion and with God's truth. Let me tell you about a friend I've got called Gordon. I was speaking to him a few weeks ago and he was telling me about how often he goes onto Edinburgh University campus. Gordon's a pastor and he just speaks to people about life. Right? Really convicting for me. I thought, when was the last time I actually did something like that? But what he said he did is he goes in and he uses the, the salt approach. Can we put the next one? The salt approach. He does this. He says, I start a conversation. I ask lots of questions. I listen to people's answers. And I tell them the gospel story. So I thought it was really good. So here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to put love is love, if you like, through the salt grinder, and we're going to see how we go. So you ready for this? Here we go. Start a conversation. I'd go further than that and say start a friendship. Here's a challenge for us, and I was really convicted thinking about this today. Do we have meaningful relationships with people who think differently to us on this? Have we earned the trust of the people around us so that this level of conversation is on the table to talk about? I just want to encourage you tonight, if you've been in the same workplace, if you've been in the same classroom for a number of years, or maybe you look out and you see that you will be there for a number of years, play the long game. Play the long game with your witnessing. Too often we see evangelism as a kind of hit and run commando mission. Let me just encourage us to be all in where we are. Be distinct for Christ. Be there for the long run. But I love it is what they nicknamed Jesus, the friend of sinners. The people looked at him and they thought both of those things are true. I think you can make a really good case for saying that in Luke's gospel, Jesus is killed precisely because of the kind of people that he's hanging out with. 
No, he's there, isn't he? He's there. Ask lots of questions. And this is straight from Jesus' playbook, isn't it, of relational evangelism. Have you ever thought, asked yourself, why does Jesus ask questions? And I take it it's just to draw people out. Right? Here's the thing for you to think about. What's your favorite question that Jesus asks someone in the Gospels? Yeah? Why do you call me good? How do you read it? Whose inscription is this? Which one was a neighbor to the man? All the way through, you see Jesus asking questions. And I think that's true, isn't it? Because good open questions help us enter people's worlds. And I think they do more than that, though. In our world of gotcha journalism and social media sound bites that are just cheap shots at people where people just seem to be firing over one another and speaking beyond one another, can I encourage us that good open questions rather than closed and cold blanket ones is one way that we can love people in our world really well. Taking the time to listen to people's stories. What's going on in their lives? What makes them tick? What do they love? How can we love them well? We want to take the time to listen face to face with people to what they've got to say because we want to communicate to a world that we love and value you. Now, here's a few questions that you might want to think about asking when it comes to this whole thing. Or even you just want to maybe think about yourself, what are some of the answers to these questions? Again, just starting a conversation, asking good questions. Ready for these? What even is love? See, when you try and do it, it's really hard. Right? One, I think one reason for it is that we only have one word in English for love, which means that I can talk about loving Haribo Fantastics and loving my wife, and at word level, we're talking about the same thing, right? In fact, Marion Webster, looked it up this week, offers us this definition of love. Love is the strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. So what do you think love is? How do you define what love is? Here's another question. Where does that desire, that longing that each of us have to be loved, where does that come from? We'll come back to that in a little minute. Where does that come from? Because here's the thing that we want to say as Christians, that we're absolutely for love. But where does it come from? Here's another interesting one. Are there any kinds of love that are out of bounds? To which I'm guessing the answer for people living today, if they really were pressed on it, is probably yes. But let me just say yes wasn't always the answer, particularly in a first century century Greco-Roman world that Jesus and the early church inhabited, where men in particular were encouraged to unleash their sexual desires in whatever way they pleased. In fact, here's a quote from respected historian Tom Holland. Now, trigger warning, this is not for the faint-hearted. It is graphic, but I think it makes the point about the brutality of the first century world that these guys are living in. He says this is on the screen. He says, in Rome, men no more hesitated to use slaves and prostitutes to relieve themselves of their sexual needs than they did to use the side of the road as a toilet. In Latin, the same word mayo meant both ejaculate and urinate. Now, yikes, yeah? Yikes. In other words, what we would rightly label today as abuse, the Romans would just just label it use, right? Business as usual. So are there any kinds of love that are out of bounds? The answer wasn't always Yes, but I imagine if push came to shove, we would say yes. And the very fact that we've arrived there, we don't have time to go into this tonight, is a profound testament to the influence that Christianity has had on our world and on our society, that in the words of Glenn Scrivener, this is the air that we breathe. 
right? And, and I can recommend some wonderful books to you that will help you think about that, the influence that Christianity has had on our world and our society, the things, the rights that we take for granted today, how often that has come from our Christian worldview. There are limits, yeah? For example, if a grown man were to justify his attraction to an of-age, consenting 16-year-old schoolgirl on the grounds of love is love, I think we would be pretty nervous about saying, go right ahead. I think we instinctively understand as a culture that there are good and right limits to love and relationships. And so all of a sudden, what was a blanket neat statement, love is love, already we're beginning to put some caveats into that. And the question, maybe you wanna go a bit further on that, is who gets to decide? what those caveats are? Who gets to decide what are the acceptable kinds of love? Who gets to decide and why do they get to decide? And here's what I think we're trying to help ourselves and help others appreciate that everyone is wearing specs through which they're viewing the world. Making everyday reactions, making everyday decisions. The real question is, what is the ground on which you are standing And I think Rebecca McLaughlin, who I'll come back to her in a minute, she's written some fantastic stuff on this. She says, so often people in our world, it's like one of those Looney Tunes cartoons. Remember when the character used to run right off the cliff and would still be running, but would not be standing on anything. And all of a sudden they would fall. She said, how often our culture's like that. We've just run right over the edge and we're not actually standing on anything if we think about it. The real question is the ground on which you're standing, is it stable? Is it stable? Guys, ask lots lots of questions and listen genuinely to people's answers. You know, I've heard it said that just like the church looks back in horror on how people often use the Bible to justify slavery, so it will do with homosexuality and same-sex relationships in 20 years' time. How do you react to that? It's worth saying, isn't it, that those who've historically used the Bible to justify slavery weren't reading their Bibles properly. Something else was going on there. Slavery in the first century is a very different thing to what we would maybe first go to in our minds, kind of African-American slavery, right? Roman culture is much more part of the economic and social setup. Doctors were slaves. Accountants were slaves. It's not quite a straight line. In fact, some of the most affectionate words that Paul uses in all of Scripture are for a runaway slave called Honest Forest. You read about him in the book of Philemon. Elsewhere, you read about Paul encouraging slaves to take their freedom if they can get it. So whilst it's not a fully accurate comparison, I think we do have to own the ways that we as the church have historically and maybe even personally got this badly, badly wrong over the years. You know, I remember when I was at school and university, uh, we so often used the word gay interchangeably with the word strange. And it makes me shudder and I'm just disgusted that I used to think like that. And perhaps flowing from that, the church over the years, we've so often viewed same-sex attraction as being somehow more serious and, and more sinful than other sexual activity which happens outside of a marriage between one man and one woman. We've we've somehow elevated that. And again, that's just something we've got badly wrong. We've got to hold our hands up and admit where we've often got this tragically wrong over the years as the church. And in doing so, we've badly, badly hurt people. So we've got to listen to people's answers. Where are people at? on this stuff. And again, remember, we are talking about first and foremost, loving people with this stuff. And then we tell the gospel story. You see, when seeking to answer the question, love is love, guys, we want to show that the Bible has something full fat to say about love that's so much better than the diet version our culture is currently offering us. Right? We believe in a God who is love. Two ways we can maybe come at this. How about instead of talking about love is love, 
we change the question to who is love? Because God is love. You know, there's so many ways that God is described in the Bible. He is holy. He is a consuming fire. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. These aren't different parts of his personality. No, the, this is who he is. John would write in 1 John 4 that God's, God is love. He is love. Now, of course, our Muslim friends would totally agree with that. Here's a question for you. How can this God be love? The answer is because our God is, is triune, right? We, our God is Father, Son, and Spirit who has existed for all eternity as a community of love. The Father delighting in the Son, in the joy of the Spirit. Love is who our God is. It's not as if we have a de definition of love and we think God is that. No, 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 it's, it's, it's the fact that we derive our understanding of love from who this God is. And that means if you've asked the question of someone, where does that longing for love come from? That's a great connecting point for our friends and family who doesn't want to experience love. But the Christian can confidently say that that longing we have that comes from within us is there. Our longing for relationship is because we were made in the image of this God who is love. And if he is deeply relational, then surely it makes logical sense that we would be as well. It's not one of the biggest things we discovered during lockdown, during COVID. How we're made for relationships. How Zoom, how a screen is no substitute for human-human interaction. It's come because we are made in the image of this God. Deeply relational. Ultimately, how do we know that God is actually like this? It's because of Jesus. Now, I think as well, it's always a great thing. I remember a friend years ago saying to me, anyone can talk about God. When the conversation gets a bit, uh, it gets a bit more pointed is when we get to Jesus. Let's always try and get our conversations to him. Always try and get our conversations to him. Puritan Thomas Watson referred to him as love covered over with flesh. How do we know what God is like? How do we know he is love? We, we look at the one who was called the friend of sinners. He loved people. Do you not love that? I, I felt that when we were doing John 11, beginning of it a few weeks ago, that John would specifically say of Jesus that he loved Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And John, who writes about himself, he was the disciple that Jesus loved. This God is no stranger to love. Right, Jesus himself said to his disciples, John 15, greater love has no one than this to lay down your life for your friends. Again, just think about that definition of love. Elsewhere, this is how the world will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. It's amazing, isn't it? In Jesus, we encounter a God whose love goes even as far, not just loving good people, no, 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 it goes way further than that. Loving his enemies. This Christ who came to lay down his life for his enemies. And that's what we were by very nature before he got involved in our lives. Laying down his life for his people on the cross. And it's true, isn't it? I think today our definition of love in our culture is saying that if you don't agree with me, you are not loving me. I've got to say that's quite a shallow definition of love. No, no, we come to this God and we see that this is a love that loves across the boundaries. This is a, a, a love that, that compels us to move across the differences, to, to not just love people who are like us and who think like us. No, it compels us to go f so, so much further than that. I can disagree profoundly with you, but I love you to the you know, to the ends of the earth. We can do both. The world is saying right now that we cannot do both of those things. And Christ would say, yes, you can. Here's the, def um, the question. Who is love? Flowing from that, how about we talk about where is love? 
One of the words that the Bible uses for the change that happens to us when we, be, when we become Christians is turning. So my favorite, you know, 1 Thessalonians 10, you can check it out in your own time or maybe during coffee. It's how it's described. You, you've turned from idols, you've turned towards the living God. So the folly is going our own way. Turning means that we start to go towards the God who is love. So always what the Bible says, you become what you behold. We turn towards beholding the God who is love. That's what repentance is, just turning from going my way, turning and going God's way. And we begin to walk in obedience to this God as he transforms our lives. And I think that's really important to say, to love God is to walk in obedience to his commands. Our world thinks that when it hears God is love, and again, this is where we've got to be careful, I think, God is love, it means that surely this God should be for my happiness, and therefore any decision that I think I will make, surely he should be happy with that. I say that's not God is love, that is love is God. No, we will show that we have turned towards this God of love when we stop going our way and start going his way. And so when we, be, when we start to behold this God of love, his beams begin to rub off on us. The church is a community, therefore, that displays this love of God. You know, in our world of LinkedIn profiles and Facebook likes and Instagram followers that almost prizes quantity and breadth of friends, which a friend of mine called anti-social media, you can take that or leave that. Do you see how Jesus calls his people, the church, to value quality and depth of relationship? Our world primary views love narrowly as being mainly sexual, but you come to the Bible and you spend time, particularly in the New Testament, and you see the kind of community that Jesus creates. And it's not just another community, it's a totally different type of community where love is displayed in much more holistic and deeper ways between people who are now brought together as brothers and sisters. It describes a whole host of relationships in the Bible. As Re Rebecca McLaughlin provocatively and powerfully puts it, the Bible is not against same-sex love. I'll give you a minute to react to that. According to Jesus, friendship isn't the poor cousin of romantic love. No, non-romantic love can be just as deep as romantic love. It's way more than a feeling. It's a commitment and it's a choice. One of the most beautiful things about being the church family, is it not? That I choose to love my brothers and sisters. That I invite them into my life. More than that, this is one of the biggest things I learned on sabbatical. I need them in my life. Here is my family who I rejoice with. Here is my family who I weep with, I bear with, I persevere with, I work out differences with, I talk about struggles with. And when the going gets tough, I don't run. When the going gets tough, I move more towards my brothers and sisters in Christ. And genuinely, friends, we should not be embarrassed about saying that we love one another. That we love one another. Here's the thing for you tonight. Say that to somebody before you leave. As a brother and sister, in Christ, I love you and need you in my life. Isn't that a wonderful thing that we're part of the same church family? The world should look in and say, as it sees us loving each other in community, transformed because we've, we are beholding this God who is love, that there's something supernatural going on there in terms of their community. The way that we love one another. Where is love? Well, it's, it's here. Where will you see this God of love? It is here. Here's the question. Do we see that in our community? Do we see that in our community? Just as we close, I want to tell you a story that I heard Sam Aubrey tell 
at the Keswick Convention this year about two ladies in his church who for about 15 years were a lesbian couple. And at some point on their journey, the Lord brought both of those women to faith in Jesus. And they picked up the phone and they phoned the pastor of Sam's church. And they said, listen, we know you. We've just become Christians. We, we want to walk in obedience to Jesus now. But we're struggling to figure out what this looks like. You're the only church that we know and trust. Can you help us out? And the pastor says on the phone, why don't you come up and move in with us? And we'll kind of figure it out as we go. So about six months after they moved up and having got to know them as good friends, Sam asked them, really honestly, do you miss being a couple? You guys were a, a couple, you were family for 15 years and all of a sudden that's, that's, uh, that's changed. Do you miss being a couple? And they said, and get this, Sam, do you know what? We are so much closer now as sisters in Christ than we ever were as lovers. Now, when I heard that story, I'll be honest and say I never saw that answer coming. And that only goes to show that in my life, I have badly underestimated two things. Number one, just how much this culture has influenced me. That maybe I didn't even think that that was possible. And number two, how much deeper and better truly is the love of God, as it manifests itself in his people, the church, that the quality of our relationships that we have, not because we've figured life out, no, 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 just, we're just trying to do life together, but we've been transformed by this God who is love. And that when we turn to him and start walking in obedience to his ways, that that really is where true life and love is to be found that we really can take Jesus at his word when he says, deny self, take up cross and follow me. That's where you'll find life. Particularly as it manifests itself in the love that we can experience in deep friendship that we have in our church family. So where is love? The Bible would say, don't settle for that shallow definition of love is love. No, 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 come to the God who is love and let him transform you. So I'm going to pray and then we'll, we'll maybe move into groups and we'll, we'll talk about this tonight. Father, I thank you so much for this evening. And Father, I pray that you would just be at work in our midst now. I recognise, Lord, that this is such a sensitive topic for us personally in so many ways. Father, maybe this is something that we're struggling with. Father, maybe this is something that we know other people look in and wonder why it is that we believe what we believe. Father, I pray that you would help us to be a community that is a safe place to talk about the things that are really going on in our lives. But Father, as well, that the world would look in and see a, a community that has been truly transformed by the God who is love. Lord, we thank you for our relationships together. Thank you for our church family. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to come to um, just represent and resemble more of the likeness of Christ in each of our lives. Father, help us to live sacrificially for each other. Help us, Father, to, to move towards each other. And Father, help us to display the wonderful love of God, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.